Hey, today I'm going to show you a lot of things. One is about this kind of machinery that are very inventive, about brain computer interface. I'm going to talk to you about small smartphone based robots, about Minecraft and using it for your research, about some chemistry work I've done in the past and about some more robots. So how does this all link together? If anything of this you're curious about, um, just follow on this talk and then we can chat about the results. So what I'm interested in is what I call tools for creativity. And the idea is to leverage machine learning to help people think. And today I want to present this to you to, you know, it's just for your interest and see if that's a topic you'd like to pursue as a PhD. So I'm going to describe who I am, some research I've done in the past, and the vision for the, my current research at the University of Glasgow and a few projects that I'm interested uh, to work on uh, with potential PhD students. So first, my name. My name is Jonathan Grisou. I am French and I did most of my uh, studies up to the PhD in France. And right now I'm a lecturer at the University of Glasgow in machine learning. You can contact me at this email you can check my website if you want to know more about my projects or check me out on Twitter. In terms of background, that's my previous academic position where I did my PhD at INRIA, which is the biggest center for artificial intelligence in France. That was, was 10 years ago when I started in 2011. And I did it on active learning, intrinsic motivation. So how do we get algorithm uh, to be motivated on their own? And then I moved the first time at the University of Glasgow, where I applied what I learned during my PhD to chemistry. So trying to have robotics, robotic assistant that would do some experiments for the researchers. And after that, I moved to Paris to be a research fellow, where I developed some more work on self-calibrating interface that I'll, work, that I'll present before. But I also have a second hat that is a one of a startup of somebody trying to push technology into the world. And I started that around 2016, where with some friend, we started a company called Poland Robotics. It's a startup that is still functioning to this day. Uh, and we did all the applying to Y Combinator incubator in the US, uh, patenting our technology, getting some grants, learning how to market and sell a product. A bit later in 2020, I went on to make my own app that I designed from scratch. I supervised some teams, so I understood a bit better what it takes to make uh, this kind of user interface and the marketing that comes with it. And very recently also, I joined in London, what's a program called Entrepreneur First that puts together a lot of young entrepreneurs to try and, and start some companies. So if you're interested in that, that's something I have quite a lot of background on and it's really impacting the way I think about my research. Talking about research, I want to highlight the two main work that I consider I've done in the past and that might be of interest. The first one is what I've done during my PhD and I continue to do it in Paris on self-calibrating interface. And the idea is as follows. If you want to, let's say, have a person use an interface such as brain computer interface, there's one thing that you need to know beforehand is you need to be able to decode what it is that those electrodes put on the brain are sensing. So in that case, the person is looking at the screen. They are looking at a particular letter, let's say N. And we want to detect if when they're looking at that letter, if it's flashing in white or if it's dark. And it turns out in the brain, there is a signal like that. And what you have to do, you have to calibrate the system. So you have to ask the person to do the same thing over and over again. So you acquire a data set. And once you have this data set, you can train a classifier. So that is this phase that you see here. And once you have done this calibration, you can start interacting. And that's number of steps. And this is like when you find a letter, right? And my work is called self-calibrating interface. So the question is, can we remove that calibration interface? And that's what I did during my PhD. And, and, and it's quite a, an interesting concept where you start using an interface without the interface knowing what you mean when you communicate to it and had some good papers out of there um, some quite good recognition also from friends where i got a phd award for for this work and it's something i'm like i'm 
very interested in portioning along different dimensions. And I did that, for example, with a more a simpler user interface. So that's something that, you know, you would have a typical interface would have two buttons that you know what they are for. And if you apply self-calibration, what happens is that you can have different users using the interface differently. And by that, I mean that they would use the buttons, uh, like assign colors to those buttons differently. Don't have time to explain much more, but that's what I call an adaptive interface. And it's a direct um, link with this work. And like the kind of stuff I like to do is, for example, putting this uh, self calibrated interface in front of a vault where people, if they want to get that chocolate egg, they have to open that box. It's kind of a challenge that makes people uh, very interested in learning about, uh, you know, how this technology works. So that's something that, uh, the kind of things I do, uh, if you're interested uh, in this kind of studies. Second line of work uh, that I've done is an assisted discovery. And that's what I've done when I was already at the University of Glasgow in the chemistry lab. And the idea is as follows. You're a chemist. Imagine you're a chemist, you're in the lab, you have new chemicals coming in and you feel like you'd like to know what you can do with those chemicals. You don't really know yet, but you want to know. So you want to explore for the sake of exploring what can be done. And the question is, you have a limited time, limited money, it costs money to make experiments, and you want to use your time as effectively as possible. So should you experiment randomly, or is there a bit of better ways to do it, given that you don't really know yet what you're looking for? You're really exploring for the sake of exploration. And I did this work on this system, which is you know, the chemistry I showed in the first slide. And those are really weird, just oil droplets on the top of water. And it turned out that at very specific concentration, they start moving or doing other sort of behaviors. And so we did that by building a robot. And the idea was to have a robot like this one that would be able to do the experiment. So be able to mix the chemicals so, and decide, make an experiment and film the experiments so that we'll be able to have an algorithm in the loop to decide what sort of experiment to do and then to analyze kind of how much we can explore using different types of algorithm. And that's where, you know, these kind of keywords come in in machine learning, exploration or optimization, active learning, intrinsic motivation. And we compared that with how humans were efficient are to exist. That's a kind of, um, you know, domain within machine learning that I have expertise and I like to pursue. The results was basically if I compare the two basic algorithms we tried, one is a grid search is like I'm going to do an exhaustive search over the space of experiments that can be done. And another one is I'm going to use what's called a curious algorithm, which is an algorithm that's been defined to mimic uh, and find curiosity kind of mimic the boredom and trying to go and look for things a bit outside their comfort zone. It turns out that this algorithm within the same experimental budget was able to generate those observation, much wider observation than this one. So if you're a scientist and you're trying to know what to do with a new chemical system, it's probably a better use of your time and budget to use this kind of curiosity algorithm. So that was part of a large body of work that I did when I was leading a team at the intersection of chemistry and machine learning. And um, that's a very interesting work. And it, I think it, what I want to show is that, is that um, I have quite a lot of experience in leading complex interdisciplinary project. And that's the kind of things I like to do. So again, if that resonates with you, please uh, feel free to contact me. I'd be really curious to discuss what can be done so that's what I've done in the past. Now I'm trying to explain how this is going to go in the next few years. And the way I'm describing that vision for research is that I want to develop technologies to assist people in their creative process at scale. And I want to unpack that for you so, so that you kind of know which kind of domain and research area this means. So when I mean by assisting people, I mean that the technology I want to develop, they need to be in front of users really quickly. So embedded in user-facing technologies, and I want to study how usable and effective they are if that is relevant for that particular technology. Um, that's important for me because uh, I feel like it's, or it's sometimes 
a bit too easy to get stuck in comparing algorithm in artificial setups. And I like to have the human in the loop to know if it's actually useful in the end. By creative process, I mean, I mean helping people to expand their field of view. I mean, like being able for them to grab information from things that would have a hard time or take a long time generating on their own. That's the example of the chemistry work I showed you. And I want, with that, I want to help people, you know, express and refine their thoughts and their, the way they think. And scale, that's an important one. I come from my startup background where I want to start the research from the onset with something that at the end of it, anybody could at least try. So that means a lot of things will be done on the web. A lot of things will, the output, the outcome of it is a web demo that anybody can try. And that's often very good to explain what we are trying to do. And, and this also often leads, and what I'm trying to do is leads to pass to, you know, either outreach, so doing arts, going into schools, or spin-offs, which is starting uh, some companies. And now I'm, I'm going to go through that vision through a few projects of mine that I'm interested in pursuing. Um, and I'll start with self-calibrating interface, which is one of the main work I did. You remember this brain computer interface when can remove the calibration and that allow people, different people to use the same interface in different ways. And this idea of removing the calibration, it's allowing personal interaction and personal expression from the user, which is some sort of creativity, which is a way to express your own creativity through the interface you have, instead of having to be forced to use the way it has been designed to. So that's how I see it within that research vision. So there's two ways I want to explore this further. One is through collaboration on, with a lot of people within the Glasgow University that work on user interface. I'm already working with John Williamson, Mohamed Kamis, and Rod Murray Smith um, at the university to try and develop new application for this technology. But there is also a lot of core machine learning research around that. So how do we scale this algorithm to more complex tasks? Like how do we make this work in continuous domain where we're not really sure how the person is interacting with the interface? Uh, if we can use, you know, make it work with deep learning to accelerate and, and pre-train some pre-calibrated model to make this process faster. So like on, on that front, I have a lot of potential PhD topics, if that's of interest to you. Another idea I want to explore is what I call Rude Goldberg machine, what is called Rude Goldberg machine. And it's the idea that you want to find the most complex system to do the simplest task. So that the idea, this one is the idea. So one of the original idea um, that the comic like that presented this idea is how to do a self-operating napkin where everything starts by feeding a bird and then a lot of things happen so that you can just uh, you know wipe your mouth and you've seen this kind of uh, videos before I'm sure where you have complete contraption to do a very simple thing this person is really well known on YouTube called Joseph Machine is very very creative person actually. And the idea is I want to use this root Gobert machine as a benchmark for both human and machine creativity. So how can we get, you know, human to solve a simple task, bring a ball from point A to a point B in a creative way. Uh, and I think the best way to explore this is to go through environment like Minecraft, for example, where you can, you know, build freely a lot of different artifacts. So that's a very creative use of the Minecraft blocks for those of you that played Minecraft before, um, where we can, you know, have something moving in space automatically using this mechanism. Can we, you know, use this environment to study creativity by asking people and algorithm to build root Goldberg machine? That's something I'm extremely interested in uh, at this stage. Another topic is educational robotics. So I told you about my startup background. And before that, we worked on a robotic project called the Poppy Project, where we made this humanoid robot with some friends. So that's uh, Mathieu Lapin, a friend of mine. I don't know if you recognize this, but that is a French president and our robots so they've met uh, a few years ago. Then we pushed that into the educational space. It was another project that led in the lab I did my PhD with. And what, I, what, what we did is we reached like thousands of users and students worldwide. And after that, we started doing that company, Poland Robotics, where we developed some more educational tools. We developed some more like 
robots that are used in educational setups too. And we also patented some modular technology because we saw some problems in the development of uh, robotics um, that it was a bit cumbersome to do and very hard to learn. And that's, that's, that's the main problem I discovered, which number one is cost. So if you want to get into schools or you want to get people to use it, there will always be a big barrier on cost. So you want to lower that if possible. Also, most of the things are really opaque for non-expert teachers, so they get afraid to bring that technology to the classroom because they get afraid of not being able to use it themselves. And then there is a big barrier to reuse and sharing. So if some students have done a work, it's really hard for other students to start reusing it. They get a bit confused in you know, managing code uh, and sharing it to others, especially when they're a bit younger. So that's why I, I have this idea of using a smartphone as the brain of the robot, and that has a few advantages. First one is the smartphone has a lot of sensors in it and everybody has a smartphone in their pocket. So it already lowers the cost because of everybody already has one in some ways. Then you can, the smartphone can either through the screen or through Bluetooth can control a lot of actuators and get, get feedback input from the outside world. So it's very cheap actually to build a very tiny piece of electronics on top of smartphone and have all the communication go through this but the main advantage of a smartphone is that you know it runs on the internet like it has access to the internet it can run very complex code through a web browser and the advantage of this is that if you want to share a piece of code you just have to share a url to a website and then immediately your smartphone can access you know the accelerometers can access the camera can access the sound and can use that sound through the web page, access it through the web page, and control some motor through it. So that in a very easy way you can share code with your friends, your partners at any at any place in the world. So that's an example of what can be done with this. That's a project I did with another student where we send information through the screen of the smartphone as a test. So likely you have two areas on the screen that are blinking at different rates. And one is connected to a wheel, one is connected to the other wheel. And then we have the camera that is tracking the red, you know, whatever is red in front of it, and acting the mot like making the motors move to follow that object. And that's how it looks like. So you see that that's a prototype, obviously, but it's working fairly well. And if we are good at doing this project, we can compete with Amazon that is doing this massive robot for self-driving car learning that they sell probably at a loss at 400 pounds that's already very expensive and i think we could work towards having a 50 dollar self driving car all these things if you remove the smartphone obviously can be done for very very cheap and you can use a, a, like advanced machine learning on the web page to try and maybe follow a track um, or do some self-driving task Finally, um, two more projects, actually, uh, one in assisted discovery, where in the chemistry lab, you remember, we were trying to automate and try to find out how we can explore that space better. That, is, well, that was really interesting for me to explore, but it has one fundamental limitation in my research statement, is that it's assisting people in their creative process, but it's really, really hard to scale. We're talking about chemistry there. We're talking about having robots doing experiments. From a scale that I think the best domain we can go through is writing domain. So how can we get people to express their thoughts creatively through a very simple web interface where they can, you know, write some tests and have some suggestion of where their storyline can go, or suggestion about what are they trying to say actually in that essay to try and get them push their thought further, kind of a Socratic method as a service. Or you can think of it as helping people write Twitter threads that are more engaging. And that's a very good area to explore because you have very quick feedback looks from the other users and there's a large user base. So maybe it's a very good place to start and helping again people having this kind of exploration of if they were doing writing an essay or writing for yourself of their own, they might not have very good quality. But if we introduce an algorithm that helps them bring information from various sources in and challenge their thinking, they might be able to be more you know, explore better and have better quality of content. That's very, very innovative to me. 
um, it's a new domain and I had access to GPT-3 for those of you that know about it. It's like very advanced, latest cutting edge language models from OpenAI. And the idea is you write some text and it's learned to complete uh, the task. So that's something that's coming really big into the machine learning space. And the idea would be to create some prompts that are parametric and that would help generate some interesting things from the user. So if you have some interest in natural language processing, that's something I'd be really keen on exploring. And there is a lot of people uh, within the idea section and the information retrieval space that is working on NLP that will be able to you know, work with us on that topic. So if any of what I presented on Rude Goldberg, Machine, Minecraft, self-calibrating interface and robotics is kind of ringing a bell to you, like raising your interest and your curiosity, please contact me, send me an email. I'm really open to have a chat and discuss what can be done around that space. Thank you very much. Uh, you can contact me at any of these links.